Hey everyone, welcome to Logan Smosh Pig. Glad to have you here. Do me a favor and please subscribe if you haven't already. Also consider joining my Patreon page for some cool perks. I'll leave a link in the description. Gather round bookworms, because the time has come for a new episode of Rock and Read. Since so many of you have been begging for it, today you will get to hear chapter 12 of Red by the Red Rocker, Sammy Hagar. Chapter 12 is called The Wabos. Here we go. I was out of Van Halen. One side of me was angry, but the other side was nothing but happy. Carrie and I got on a plane with our brand new baby to go back to Maui. We had a little dog called Winchell that we snuck on board. He can't take a dog to Hawaii. They quarantined the sucker for six months. We were planning to stay a good spell. I certainly didn't have any big plans, so we pumped a little pooch full of doggy tranquilizers and stuffed him into a bag. Sitting across the aisle in the first class cabin was Mickey Hart from the Grateful Dead. I knew who he was, but we'd never really met before. He and his wife Carol were headed over to the islands for some downtime, which it turns out is something Mickey Hart knows nothing about. Bill Cosby was also on the flight, about four rows behind us. It was an early morning flight, and we were snoozing as the plane was getting ready to land. Out of the corner of my ear, I hear that famous Bill Cosby voice speak up, Oh, what a cute little dog. I turned around and looked. There was Winchell, staggering down the aisle, wobbling, tripping, falling like a drunk. He was a rat terrier, and he dug his way out of the bag, unzipped the thing and got loose. We were busted. Mickey's wife turned out to be a lawyer and she swung into action. We had to stay behind on the plane. Bill Cosby walked by me looking at his bag and going woof woof. Mickey and Carol stayed with us. We were there for a couple hours. This was a serious deal. We were facing a possible $25,000 fine and even jail, but after a few hundred dollar bills were passed around, a dog carrier was brought to the plane, and Winchell went into the baggage compartment to fly home with the stewardess, who handed him off to some of our friends who were waiting for the dog in San Francisco. When I got on that airplane to go to Hawaii, I had accepted that Van Halen was done. I was going to Hawaii because my place there is my sanctuary. If I went to Cabo, the press would have been all over me. What happened? What happened? I just wanted to lie back and figure out what to do. I was going to Hawaii to get my head together and decide what I really wanted. Did I really want to keep doing this? Financially, I certainly didn't have to work. I had been doing that tour album, tour album grind since Montrose. I was thinking I was going to lie back, do nothing until something came to me. I wasn't looking to put a band together. I was going to hide out. But Mickey Hart wouldn't let me. Mickey came over to my house in Maui every day. I told him I was through with the music business. He told me that I had to get right back on the horse, that I was too talented to quit. He would come over, light up big fat joints, and get me to play guitar. He had all these cassettes of African music and would be constantly snapping tapes in the deck and telling me, listen to this. He totally put me right back on the horse, that knucklehead. Mickey's the most energetic guy in the world. He has never taken off five minutes in his life. He reads six newspapers a day, writes a couple chapters in a book, knocks off a couple songs, and goes to rehearsal. What do you mean you're going to take some time off, he wanted to know. For him, it wasn't even about, you've got to show these guys. It was simpler than that. You're a musician and a singer, so that's what you do. He has this catalog of beats and world music that he's collected over the years and carries around with him. He had Egyptian, African, South American, all these different styles of music. He kept playing all this music I had never heard before. It was very inspiring. I picked up a guitar and started jamming, and in no time, we'd written about four or five ideas. He was coming over every day, rolling up a fat one. They've got the good stuff over there, too. I didn't smoke as much as he did, but he'd get pretty high and would get me worked up. I turned around and came back to California. I went up to Mickey's house, and the two of us would crank up this African music as loud as it would go. I played guitar, and he sat down at the drums, and we jammed for about three days. 
Marching to Mars was the only song that stuck, but I got interested in doing these other kinds of grooves. I was drawn back into making a record. I asked Mickey to co-produce it with me. I started thinking about putting a band together. I had just gotten out of the frying pan and Mickey dragged me right back into the fire. If he hadn't been on that airplane, I probably would have stayed in Hawaii for months. We went into the studio and Mickey went totally crazy. He never stopped. He piled up overdub after overdub until he needed to bring in another recorder. For one track we did, Marching to Mars, he brought in four 24 track machines and used all 96 tracks. Hart was on the phone at 4 o'clock in the morning trying to find another 24 track when engineer Mike Clink from the Guns N' Roses sessions finally said, That's enough. This one song took more time and was turning out more expensive than the whole rest of the album. I made the mistake of telling Mickey to stop. You wasted enough time and money on this one track, I said. He got so insulted. He went out and sat in his car, rolled up the windows, and lit a joint. Nobody could find him. I finally went out to the car and there he was, sulking. I apologized. It's 4 o'clock in the morning, I told him. We're all worn out. We finished the track, the last cut on the album, which had been finished for almost three months, except for this one final track. I love the guy. He may be the most high energy, hardest working, most enthusiastic person I've ever met. For the album Marching to Mars, the band included Denny Carmassi from Montrose on drums, Bootsy Collins on bass for a couple tracks, and John Pierce from Huey Lewis and the News on the rest. Jesse Harms played keyboards, and the engineer Mike Quink also produced a bit. I went into the studio and made the best record I could possibly make, an artsy record, a sharp left turn from Van Halen. It was one of the best solo records I've ever made. Every song is great. I paid for the record myself and didn't want record companies involved until I was done. For the release of Marching to Mars, I signed a deal with a new label run by Sid Scheinberg, former head of MCA. He had retired and started this movie company called The Bubble Factory and a new record company called The Track Factory. They gave me a large advance and big points. I was the only act on the label and they would do whatever I wanted. It was like a dream come true. We went to Hong Kong and did a press event. We went to Japan and played acoustic at a couple of in-stores. The first week the record came out it sold 44,000 copies. Not chicken feed, but not millions. The next week the company folded. They had put out a big budget movie starring Betty Midler which bombed my record and that was it. They went out of business. MCA took over, but the momentum was lost. The record was done. In the end, it sold pretty well, but it was a disappointment to me because I came out of a band that was selling 5 to 7 million records. Marching to Mars sold about 400,000. I took a long fall, but it was a successful record in its own way. The Track Factory hadn't been the only option. There had been another guy who wanted me to sign to Hollywood Records, the Disney label. He slept on my floor for four days, trying to get me to sign a record deal. He wrote up a deal on a cocktail napkin. It was big money, way more than the other guys, but I backed out at the last minute. He was too crazy. On the cover, he was going to have a van with Hagar painted on the side. He was going to tour the van to every record store in the country and give it away in a contest at the end. I decided to put a band together. I wanted somebody the opposite of Eddie Van Halen. Every guy I auditioned would try to do Eddie's five finger tapping thing. Anytime somebody did that, they were done instantly. I wanted a black guy who played more like Hendrix or Stevie Ray Vaughan. Somebody told me that Vic Johnson of the Bus Boys was a big Montrose freak. I brought him up from Los Angeles for an audition. I asked him, did he know Three Lock Box? Yeah, he said, and off he went. I hired him on the spot. I had David Louser back on drums, and Jesse Harms played keyboards. Jesse was real important to my music during this period. He supported my songwriting, writing bridges and choruses, and he was a soulful singer, although we eventually had a headbutt, and I fired him. I wanted a girl bass player, and they were hard to find. White Zombie had one. David Louser found Mona Nader. She was living way up in the sticks near Willits, California. 
She pulled up to my house on a Harley with her bass strapped on the sissy bar, and she could play her ass off. One thing I loved about Mona is she's like Michael Anthony's twin. She's left-handed, but she plays right-handed. She's a little fire plug, about the same size. They both have this high voice. They're like sister and brother from another mother. The second Mona started playing in my band, I became a better singer. Most bass players play really hard, like Michael Anthony, banging it until he's knocking it out of tune. Singers get their note from the bass, whether they know it or not. You may think you're listening to the piano or the guitar, but the second that bass starts to play, you're singing to the bass. Mona has tiny fingers, and she plays like Paul McCartney, very soft. She cranks up the amplifier, but she hits the strings lightly. Suddenly, I sing dead on key. Carrie had to spiff up Mona a bit. Mona never owned any clothes, but a pair of shorts, a pair of jeans, motorcycle boots, and a t-shirt, and she never wore lipstick or makeup in her life. I decided I wanted to dress like Janis Joplin, so I went to Hate Street before that tour and bought crushed velvet stretch pants. I was going to go hippie in this band with a biker chick and a black guy. I didn't want a heavy metal glamorous rock band. It took me a while to figure out exactly who we were, but I knew I had this great quirky little band that I named the Wobberitas, and later shortened to the Wobbos, and we rehearsed every day. We did 142 shows that year. I went to promoters named Louis Messina and Irv Zuckerman out of St. Louis, the two guys most responsible for breaking me way back in the beginning and arranged for them to co-produce the entire tour. I played 3,000 seat theaters and did every city in the country, 142 shows that year and another 138 the next year. We went door to door. Everywhere we went I was saying, I am back. I am back. It was the hardest I ever worked, twice as hard as Van Halen. I kept meaning to slow down, but instead, I keep stepping it up. I don't know what's wrong with me. I tried a bus for about the first two weeks of that tour. We were playing almost every night. I'd get back on the bus and I couldn't sleep. I chartered an eight-seater turbo prop Beach 200. It was expensive for how much we were making in the theaters. I was carrying a pretty big production. I hired Jonathan Smeaton who did all these great Peter Gabriel shows, and he knew how to take one truck's worth of gear and make it look huge. He was also a great lighting designer, but all that was expensive. I didn't really care about the money I was making on tour. I was just trying to get back in the game. Carrie loved our band, and everybody loved little Kama. Vic Johnson would sit with Kama on his lap on the airplane. That's how we rolled. We all jumped on this airplane, every seat taken, tour manager sitting on the toilet in the back, and we flew all over the country. We were trying to write songs for a second album while we were on the road. I wanted to do it the old-fashioned way. When we weren't touring, we went down to Cabo. That's where we started to find out who we were and invent the party. I decided that I wanted to make my own tequila for the cantina. I had first tasted real tequila when I was shopping for furniture for the cantina in Guadalajara. The 100% agave brands were not available in the states at the time like they are now. I had always loved the ritual of tequila, the salt, the hit, the lime. That's fun when you're partying with friends, but you don't have to do that with good tequila. The salt is important for the first taste, to clear your palate like having a salad before a steak. It just sets it right up. When I tasted real tequila, I flipped out. Just finding agave growers to make it for me was difficult. Most of them sold their crops to the big manufacturers, and if they kept any to make their own, they made small batches, like 20 cases, for their family and friends to drink. I finally found a farmer who would do it and deliver the tequila in brand new 5 gallon gas cans and plastic bottles. We transferred the tequila to oak barrels, real tequila aging barrels that we bought, and served it right out of the barrel. When I had just started making the tequila, Carrie and I were still going over to Maui every chance we could get. Even though we were working so hard, I got reacquainted with Shep Gordon, Alice Cooper's manager who lived in Maui, and owned one of the island's greatest restaurants. I showed him the tequila and he liked it. He called Willie Nelson, who also has a place on the island, and Willie came over to Shep's to taste the tequila. That's good tequila, he said.
I had some porcelain bottles made and we started bottling the stuff. Shep Gordon found a distributor on Hawaii and we shipped a hundred cases as a test. The corks didn't fit, the bottles cracked, half the cases arrived upside down. It was a mess. We started making bottles out of hand-blown glass and shipping over more cases until we finally got it right. Our manufacturer landed in trouble with the Mexican government who confiscated some of their property for back taxes and they were demanding a million dollars to go ahead. We started looking for another grower. That's when we found the Rivera family. Three generations of family. The grandfather, the father, and the son all working together in the fields. They didn't even have factories. They had mules pulling carts in the field. These guys would dig a hole in the ground, start a fire, and cook the ugave right there. Their tequilas were really trippy, much smokier, but very inconsistent. Every batch was different. Every now and then, they would hit on something. In 1999, Shep Gordon made a deal with Wilson Daniels, a high-end wine dealer. I knew who they were since I'd been collecting fine wines since the president of Capitol Records gave me a case of 1966 Pachon Leland Bordeaux for Christmas. These guys dealt with wine so fine and so limited in production, people were happy if they could buy a couple bottles, never mind a couple cases. They were interested in getting into the spirits business and ordered 6,000 cases of Cabo Wabo. The Riveras had to step up to deliver. They were used to making 20, maybe 50 cases a year, but they managed. About this time, I ran into Nareda Michael Walden, the Marin County record producer who made these big Whitney Houston hit records, How Will I Know and all that. He said he wanted to produce me, and I asked him, if I let him produce me, what would he do? He told me to go out and find my favorite rock track, loop it, and write a new song. The rappers were all doing that. Tone Locke's funky cold Medina had actually used rock candy. The first thing that popped into my head was Rock and Roll Part 2 by Gary Glitter. I'm thinking, great idea. I asked Jesse Harms to loop it and I wrote, Mass Tequila. We went into my little basement studio and Louser played drums. Everybody at MCA got all excited. The Wabos and I made our record album, Red Voodoo Downstairs, crammed in, totally digging the small-time basement studio vibe. I didn't care if the drums sounded like and there was leakage. If it was a good take, that was the magic I wanted. It was the opposite of marching to Mars. Shep came down to Cabo. We went to the factory. He came to the cantina. He saw the band. I had this 100% agave tequila that was freaking out everybody who tasted it. He saw me on stage in a bathing suit, Mona wearing shorts and flip-flops. Roll it all together, he said. It made sense. Take the lifestyle and bring it to the stage. It was who we were. We were getting ready to bring out the tequila. It all snapped together. I had heard of Jimmy Buffett, but didn't really know what he was about. Carrie drew the connection immediately and she took me to see a Jimmy Buffett concert at Shoreline Amphitheater in Mountain View. I asked Jonathan Smeaton, who had been so great on the last tour, to design a set that looked like the Cabo Wabo. He went down for a week, took pictures, made drawings, and came back with a stage. He got the audience on stage. He's got those palm trees, the palapa roof, everything. Mass Tequila comes out and is a huge hit. Most ads the first week, fastest rock radio track to the top of the charts, stayed there for weeks, one of the big hits of the year in 1999. After the song came out, I ended up with only one third of the songwriting credit, even though I took out the loop and reversed the chord change. MCA's lawyer split the take with Gary Glitter and his songwriting partner. Shep Gordon talked the Hard Rock Cafe into hosting a promotional tour. He got MCA to pay. We did 14 cities, free concerts tied in with radio stations, the works, and we launched the tequila. We sold 37,000 cases the first year, instantly the second best selling premium brand in the country. Looking back now, I can see I wanted to be a small time band again, get far away from that gigantic Van Halen scale. I wanted to go back and be a club band, roll that whole Cabo Wabo vibe into everything. We loved playing down there. We'd go down there on our time off and have a blast. We'd play for free at the cantina. The place was always packed. Everybody was drunk. Nobody cared what we played. I was done with that big time Van Halen thing. 
When we went out on that tour, I opened the show by walking out in front of a closed curtain wearing shorts, shades, tank top, and flip-flops, house lights up. I'd introduce the Wabos, and then I would have a waitress in a bikini bring me the fixings and make myself a cocktail. I'd finish with the tequila. Here's the way you do it, I would say. You put a little Cabo in there. As soon as I said cheers, the band would break into an acapella version of Cabo Wabo. It was something a little different for my crowd. That was the invention of the Wabos. We became exactly who we were. This is the way I live. This is the way I play. These are the kind of songs I sing. We found ourselves and that's when the whole birthday bash thing took off. The Cabo Wabo became a place where anybody could come down and play. I never charged for my birthday bash. It was special to me. I brought my whole family, my brothers and sisters and their families, everybody. People started showing up. Slash, Alice Cooper, Rob Zombie, Mickey Hart, Bob Weir, Steven Steeles, drummer Matt Sorum and bassist Duff McKagan of Guns N' Roses, Jerry Cantrell from Alice in Chains, Billy Duffy from The Colt, and of course, Michael Anthony. Chad Smith, the Red Hot Chili Peppers drummer, started coming. Toby Keith flies in every year for my birthday. Kenny Chesney came down one year with his whole band and played for 3 hours and 40 minutes. He holds the record at the Cabo Wabo for how long he played. He wore my ass out playing Eagles Fly. Fall in Love Again, some of the Van Halen songs, his favorite stuff. He still claims the only reason he came off the stage was because he had to take a pee. He was drinking a lot of beer up there. John N. Whistle of the Who had a timeshare down there. His birthday was October 9th, the day after my brother's. He came down every year for my birthday party. My annual birthday celebration usually lasted two weeks or more. N. Whistle loved to party. We probably played together there five years in a row. The last year before he died, he came over to my house. He was so deaf. He spoke really low because his hearing aids were turned up so loud. He took them out to change the batteries and the things were screeching louder than the waves crashing outside my deck. I couldn't believe he didn't hear it. He put them back in like nothing happened. What a sweet man. He was pretty high most of the time. John always had a drink and a cigarette in his hand. He didn't walk around with his hands free. He wore snakeskin boots, tight jeans, and giant belt buckles with spiders on them, flashy shirts, and big old shades. I'd try to get him to sing Boris the Spire, but he'd go, Oh man, I can't sing. We jam on Who tunes, My Generation, Won't Get Fooled Again, Summertime Blues. I always played guitar when John was there. I loved playing the Who songs with John. He could really play. I never saw a set of fingers on anyone like his. He would take Mona's amp, her Mickey's amp, and blow them up. Every time. I've got good pictures on the cantina wall of John. One year, Stephen Stills came down. There was a bunch of people already there. Matt Sorum, Michael Anthony, Cherry Cantrell, and a couple of the guys from Metallica. Drummer Lars Ulrich and guitarist Kirk Hammett, along with my whole band. Stephen's tour manager called ahead. I told him we would be excited to see Stephen, and was there anything he likes that I could get him? Stephen likes Coke, he said. Still showed up around midnight. We had already played a set, Lars Ulrich, Jerry Cantrell, and a bunch of us. He walks in wearing a tweed wool jacket. It's 110 degrees outside. He's got long pants, boots, sweating like a maniac, dragging his overweight ass up the stairs. I'm a big fan, but this guy is up. I take him to the bathroom and give him a gram of coke that I had somebody get. He opens it up, closes it back, throws it on the ground, reaches into his pocket, and pulls out a Bayer aspirin bottle full of Coke. I've got my own, he said. He tapped out a bottle cap for each nostril. Pow. Pow. I did a little. It was powerful. A guy who tried some later told me it was so strong you touched it and your face went numb. Everybody dug in. We went out and Steven started playing Crossroads. Matt Sorum played drums, Jerry Cantrell and I were playing guitar, and Michael Anthony was on bass. After a bit, Lars slid in behind the drum set and Steven struck up for what it's worth. Lars didn't know the song, so he just started beating on things. Steven stopped the song. Where's that other drummer? He said. Get that other drummer down here. Lars practically crawled off stage, but Steven was cool. He didn't care. He wanted the other drummer. Then those guys got lost for three days. They disappeared. They went out that night, they went someplace, and didn't come back. 
I can't hang like that. When they came back, I heard what happened. They all said Stephen took them down, all the young bucks, and showed them. He put us all to shame, Laura said. We saw the sun come up three times. I tried to get with Stephen another night. I went over to this penthouse place where he was staying and took a couple of acoustic guitars. He is really a great acoustic guitar player, and I wanted to learn something from him, some of his tunings, maybe co-write a song. We got so high, by the time we picked up the guitars, it was useless. I tried to show him a song idea, and he couldn't care less. Then he would try to show me something, and I'd be like, Okay, well, maybe, no, next. There was no connection. I love Steven, but he's a hard guy to communicate with. What's with Steve, I asked his tour manager. He shines me on. You say something to him, he'll turn around and walk away. He can't hear, he said. He probably doesn't even know you said anything. I climbed aboard the airplane to go home. I was flying commercial and looked across the tarmac. Here comes Steven, limping his way to the plane, dragging his leg like the mummy. He's still wearing the tweed sport coat. He probably hasn't changed his clothes the whole time. He plopped down in the seat across the aisle, one row ahead in the first class cabin. He didn't even acknowledge me. Finally, he recognized me and said hello, but he was shut down, not talking. His leg was obviously hurting. Then it occurred to me, all the seafood, the dehydration, the booze, the blow, this cat had gout. I've had it. I know what it's like. He had been eating shrimp and lobster, rock clams. I bring all that stuff into the dressing room. We had these wonderful seafood feasts. He was drinking tequila like a fish and wearing that jacket. He sweated his ass off, probably didn't drink any water. He said he was in such agony on the plane, his leg was killing him. Gout definitely. I left him alone. When we got to customs, I ditched him completely. I didn't see myself going through customs with him. No telling what he had on him. Well, that's the end of chapter 12. Let me know what you thought of chapter 12 in the comments below. That does it for today's video, guys. I hope you enjoyed. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. I really appreciate the support. I'll see you next time. Till then, rock on.